Thank you. Um, and so, for a start, I'll also say that um, if I seem a bit hesitant um, during the talk, I am a stammerer, okay? So um, it's a lifetime problem, but, but don't, don't, hope that, don't, don't let that worry you, because I do have a lot to say. Um, possibly too much. I, I, was, I, I was going through them in the notes, trying to cut them down, and, this program, um, and it kept growing. So hopefully we'll get you all out of here before midnight. <laughs> um, but on the plus side, I'll probably forget half of it, so it all, all evens out. So, uh, right, January, January uh, 1978, um, there was 5,000 basketball fans watching the home team play, um, and then a mere six hours later, at about quarter past four in the morning, um, during heavy snowfall, um, the Hartford Civic Centre roof collapsed. Um, under the weight of wet snow. Yeah, six hours earlier, very few of those fans would, 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 have, would have survived, um, but as it was, nobody was hurt. Ironically, um, the snow load was only about three quarters of the actual design load, so something went seriously wrong here. Um, the Schleppner Art Oil Rig, um, 1991, the, the oil rig, a gravity base um, of the oil rig was being floated out um, um, in the fjords into the North Sea for installation. Um, when, 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 when the crew on the, on the base uh, which was floating, they, they heard some loud banging noises, they evacuated quickly, and a few minutes later, um, the $700 million structure hit the bottom of, of, of the sea um, with enough force to register three on the Richter scale. Um, both of these problems, uh, both, both of these, these structural disasters were um, caused, well, there were some serious design flaws in them, but they were also, the common theme was, was, was that they both used uh, very bad uh, finite element analysis models. Um, now, there may be, um, yeah, that there are a number of ways to, to build good models, but there are also some very common ways of building bad models. Um, so, uh, and, and I mean, I've experienced the, the, these, these in my own practice over time, but I also deal with a lot of software support when people send me their models and say something's wrong with the model, what's going on? So, um, um, we see quite a few of, of these. Now, the final element analysis methods has become the dominant uh, practice these days. It, um, in the olden days, you had to use, you know, if you had a particular structural straight, you had to use particular formulas and so on, but the good thing about FE analysis is it will deal with absolutely any shape you throw at it with one model and, and then look at a variety of different problems. So it's a very powerful thing, but um, it's, it's not, not understood very much, I don't think. I mean, university courses tend to concentrate a lot on the mathematics of, of, of FE analysis, but um, the math is no good uh, um, unless you give it a good model. Um, and um, this is where, where, where the practicing engineers come in. As a practicing engineer, you're not going to be writing your own FE program in general, but you are going to be producing models uh, and then rely on results. So how do we go about building bad models? First thing to remember is that FE, finite element analysis, is actually approximate, finite element approximation, as we like to call it. Um, they say that all models are wrong, but some models are, are more useful than others. It's, I mean, it's a phrase which comes from economics originally, but it applies equally to, 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 to structural analysis. Because um, after all, you know, we are building an approximation of, of the real structure. Now, um, how approximate is it? How, pro how approximate can you get away with? I mean, scheme design, yeah, you can get away with a very rough model. But against detail design, it has to be accurate. But how accurate? I mean, 100% accuracy is not actually possible. 90, 95%, is that enough? How do you know how accurate your model is? These are actually quite difficult questions. I'm not sure if there is any particular answer. Um, so how do things work? Um, now, static linear analysis very typically uses the stiffness matrix method. 
Um, essentially, this is a series of simultaneous equations which the program is solving to find the answer. So, I mean, you may remember that this formula there, the, the K, the stiff, this matrix of the model, the U, the, uh, the movement of, of all the nodes in the structure, and the F matrix, the, 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 the matrix of the external forces. Now, if this is a statically indeterminate structure, this is an approximate solution. There is no definite, definite answer. Um, but in terms of maths, that is as far as I'm going to go in today's talk. Um, so whilst static analysis or linear analysis is finding the equilibrium of the structure at its undeformed position, for non-linear analysis, you're looking for the equilibrium at the de deformed position, so for large de deformed structures. In this case, you're not using the matrix methods, but you're iterating to find the final answer, and, and they're converging on the answer. So again, there's convergence, tolerance, and so on, and um, how close you get can depend on how long you've got, for example, and so on. Um, so the, the model, um, so, so the, the, the model contains, you know, simplification. So uh, we don't generally model connections I I in the building model, for example. I mean, our mechanical engineering colleagues will, might model a single component that down to absolute final detail. For a building model, we model just beams as 1D elements, uh, maybe some 2D elements in there for slabs and shells and so on. But it's a simplification. Um, we estimate the structural sizes first work out the forces and then maybe refine those and then, and then look at the connections and so on and drill down in, in, into detail. Um, so, I mean, even this simplistic approach can result in some very large models. I mean, I've seen some airport models with over 100,000 uh, elements in there. Um, so, even keeping things simple, you know, it gets big. If you start, start to do the 2D meshes or even worse, 3D um, three meshes, the numbers of elements grow exponentially. So in many respects, the, the, the structure is not the real structure, it's a map of the, of the structure. So we know um, um, when we're dealing with maps of the countryside, it's a simplification. It, it, it's, a, it's a representation of, of reality, which in sufficient detail to give us the answer that we're looking for. Um, so we're trying to get close to the answer. Now, remember that the computers... Um, are dealing with uh, numbers. Now, the real structure has, is a physical, physical structure, it has forces on it, but we are dealing with, with numbers to represent the forces, to represent the structure of stiffness and so on, which are approximated. Now, um, how do numbers approximate? Um, if we take one example, integers. So integers, whole numbers, each integer approximates to a range of numbers. So like two approximates to one and a half to two and a half. It's a range of um, applications of the numbers. So um, which sort of explains, what, uh, there's a favorite joke of one of my colleagues that says that uh, one plus one equals three for some large values of one. Um, I'll let you think about that one. Um, uh, so, and it's interesting, but in, in computers, we're generally using floats, floating model, um, float, floating numbers, floating point numbers. Um, now, here I've just used floats to one significant place, just for illustrative purposes. You can see that each of these numbers, again, represents quite a large spread, and the bigger the number, the wider the spread of, of numbers that the, these are relating to. Now, if your, if your model coordinates are large, um, this means the numbers you're dealing with are off, you know, to the right and, or, or possibly a long way or, 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 or off the end of the chart. So, so the further away your model is from the origin, the zero, zero point in the model, the less accurate it will be. So one thing you've got to watch out for when you're importing a model from a BIM program, um, of which, you know, Revit... Tecla, Archicad, and so on. Um, they're often built at ordnance survey coordinates, but for analysis, you've got to move them to a, sort of a nice, sensible, small site coordinates for, for maximum accuracy. Also, in the numbers, I mean, say we're using one significant place there. Um, most modern computers are working to 64 bit numbers. Now, 64 bits is 64 binary bits, which means when we're looking at decimal numbers, it's about 16 decimal places. 
Um, so reasonably accurate, um, but it's still, yeah. Other than that. Other factors, um, thing called ill conditioning. Um, now, one of the best ways of reducing the accuracy of the model is to have a very wide range of stiffnesses in the model. Um, a very wide range of stiffnesses makes it harder for the, 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 the simultaneous equations to sort of converge on an accurate answer. And the best way of doing this is to use very long thin elements mixed with very short stiff elements. I mean, in this example here, um, we've got a short stub beam with a long beam. Even in this simple model, the short beam on the left is 5,000 times stiffer than the, the, than the right-hand element. Um, if you to make that, that, that element short, each shorter, it may, makes it far worse. So remember, the stiffness is based on the Young's modulus and the stiffness value of the section divided by, by, by the length. So very short elements become very stiff very, very quickly. Um, Likewise, um, uh, yeah, very long elements with very low stiffness, or even worse, zero stiffnesses. You sometimes see models w w where people ha have added zero stiffnesses into the model to try and release things, uh, 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 and that can cause huge problems. Um, there are usually ways the program can allow you to add in zero stiffnesses in a controlled manner, but if you, say, add in, say, a zero axial um, cross-sectional air or something like that, um, you won't run into problems very quickly. Um, one way of dealing with this, let's say you want to avoid bending in the elements. So rather than using beam elements, which have um, a bending capacity, a bending degree of freedom, use a bar. Bars only consider axial loads. Uh, because they don't have the degree of freedom to consider bending, it's not included in the, in the analysis at all, and, and you therefore avoid those, those, uh, those zero stiffness problems. If the hands, you have a beam element and set the bending stiffness to zero, um, you're in for a, a, a major problem. In fact, hopefully the, the, the program will actually reject that, that model, but not necessarily. Um, so one of the ways of finding out about the ill conditioning of the model is, is to look at the total loads and reactions. And remember from Newton, um, um, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So in this case, we have a small force action on the right-hand side, and the two reactions should sum to equal that, that, that react reaction on the right. Obviously, we've got two very large numbers, it should equal a very small number, and hopefully it will come close. It's never exact, it's an approximate method, but, but you should always check these just to see if the answers are close enough. Speaking of warnings, um, your, your program you use will probably give you warnings when you run the analysis. My advice here is to read them. Um, the number of models that I get is saying, oh, something's wrong with the model, what's going on? I run the analysis, I read the warning messages and says, oh, you've got a problem here or a problem there or so on. Um, the, the, these messages are there, they're, they're, they're there to, to help you. Um, now, um, about warnings, um, the Hartford, Hartford Civic Center, I mean, I'll, I'll come back to the, the two um, Hartfords and Slep the Orig over the course of, of the talk, but Hartford Civic Center, maybe they didn't get warnings on, on their analysis model. Um, I mean, this is, they did analyze it back in the early 70s when the models were n known where near as sophisticated as they are now, but when it got on site, um, they started to, to lift the roof up, and deflections were twice as much as they were, ex were predicted by, by the model. That should have given them some warnings. So if the deflections are twice as much, twice, what else has been, been, been doubled or halved, as the case may be? Another classic error, getting the units wrong. Um, now... Very common, common mistake. Um, very, what may get what, what units wrong? Um, in the dimensions of the model, the materials, the section dimensions, and so on, is maybe confusion over, say, 
Is it in metres or millimetres? Um, are you using newtons or kilonewtons? Um, a mistake in, in, in the length can give you, um, it can mean you'll be out by a factor of a thousand in the length, um, um, hundred, uh, by a factor of a million in, in, in the pressure, and if you're looking at volume, you're, um, you, you, you're looking at a billion times, um, or, uh, yeah, um, 10 to 9 um, out. Um, I mean, you know, for, uh, I teach at Bradford, uh, and we had um, so some coursework for the students recently, and they had to do two models. Same model, one in a 1D element, one in 2D elements. The 1D element had a point load on, the 2D element had ha model had pressure. And um, I, of course, um, took off, 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 off points for, for whenever they calculated the pressure wrong, and that wasn't very nearly all of them. Um, um, it, it can be difficult to work out pressures on, on, on small areas. So, yeah, Kate, Pay, pay very close attention to, 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 to the units. Um, section dimensions. Um, sometimes you might get, you might think you're working one units in the sections, and you're actually not. So you might be, you know, um, have your I beam a thousand meters deep, rather than millimeters. Classic way of checking that: swi switch on the section display. Um, most models, you can switch on the section display, and if your model vanishes, then either the sections are very, very, very small, or they're very, very, very large, and you're actually inside them. Oops. Yes, again, total loads. Um, I mentioned total loads and reactions. Um, it's worthwhile doing a quick sum, work out approximately how much total load you're expecting on the model, and then look at the total loads output from your analysis, and the two should, should match up, or at least be, be, be in the same ballpark. Um, yeah, um, likewise, uh, units loadings. Yeah, uh, most loads are in the uh, vector directions, so the Classic one to get wrong is the gravity loads. Um, so a building design program, uh, when you're building just a building model, these are designed to do just buildings, and they're quite happy at taking gravity loads as positive loads. With FE analysis, all the loads are in the directions of the, of the axes. So if you've got um, your vertical is your z-axis, z-axis goes up, so gravity loads must be negative. Um, and I must be over after 30 odd years of doing FE models, I still regularly put positive loads in for the gravity loads. But I've also learned to immediately go to the graphical view, switch on the load graphics, the arrows and so on, and just make sure the loads are going in the direction that, that, that I was expecting. Um, moment loads can be a little bit trickier. Sometimes the graphics are harder to interpret. And remember, most models will use either the left hand rule or the right hand rule. If you've got a right hand rule, you know, the thumb is your direction of the axis and your fingers point in the, the positive moment direction. Um, check check, check which, which option your program actually uses. Boundary conditions. Or, or, or restraints. Now, all models need boundary conditions. Um, now, in our case, structures, they are usually restraints, which are points of zero movement. Um, and these represent the, the way where the structure connects to the wider world, the foundation, some larger structure, and so on. Um, or they could be just be modeling a floor, and they represent the columns, where they're connecting down, and so on. Um, and um, sometimes they can be tricky to work out. Um, when I was at university, I, I knew a, a PhD student who was doing some vibration analysis on the International Space Station. Um, and this was about 10 years before it was launched. And um, so doing analysis on the structure. Now, if we were modeling a building or a bridge, 
we know the positions where the foundations are, and these are our fixed points. This doesn't have any fixed points. Um, but yet, they were still looking at, at how the structure was going to go vibrate. Now, you can't, you can't assign um, points of zero movement in a model like this. It's not feasible. So they were probably using um, a sort of different type of boundary condition where we're saying the, the, average or the, the average movement of the whole model is going to be zero rather than specific points in the model. And so therefore, you can get all the vibration modes occurring without artificially constraining them. Um, other problems. Um, sometimes, you know, you might have forces only in the vertical direction. So does that mean that you don't need horizontal restraints? Well, no, you do need, you always need restraints in all directions, even if the, uh, the model doesn't have any forces applied in those directions. So you have to make sure the model can't rotate or translate overall, otherwise, um, in theory, it will vanish over the horizon or to the centre of the Earth, but in mathematical terms, it will have a zero stiffness, and zeros are never good when it comes to, 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 to division. So make sure you've always got restraints in there, even if, if, they, if you don't think they're required, but, 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 but the maths does still require them. Um, now, quite often with steel structures, we can just put pins, supports everywhere, um, steel frames and so on, and it might not generate horizontal reactions, but some structures do need restraints where the, you, you have the horizontal reactions. So arch structures, portal frames and so on. These structures are, are very sensitive um, to, 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 to getting, getting the, the support conditions correct. Um, what about general beams? Um, you can apply too much restraints to the model. Um, now, um, probably like me, uh, first university, we're doing beam theory. The lecturer always said when you're doing a beam, you put a pin at one end, a roller at the other. Um, and I was thinking, but it makes no difference. You could put a pin at both ends and it'll still, still give the, the same answer. Um, what I didn't realize at the time was that these beams we were looking at, we were modeled about the, the neutral axis of the beam. So in, in that instance, it doesn't make a difference. Um, but real support like this here, this bearing, is actually on the bottom of the beam. And so in this situation, it can make a huge difference um, whether you have a roller or a pin support. Now, example, here we have two trusses same load, same span, everything, everything's, everything's the same, except the top one has a pin at both ends, and the bottom one has, has a roller at the right. So the right-hand one is a vertical restraint only. Um, when we look at the axial forces in the structure, we see they are very, very different. Uh, the top structure is actually acting like an arch. Uh, and we see we get, get huge... Um, So we actually see so we get getting very large horizontal reactions on this upper, upper truss. The lower truss, vertical reactions only, and we're getting the balanced top and bottom tension compression, so it's acting like a beam as we expect. Now, if we had modeled the structure with a pin um, restraint at, at the top, like that, and then built it on site, this structure would be looking for those reactions. And it will deflect and deform until it either generates those reactions from the supporting structure, or it breaks the, the supports, or it eventually becomes a roller and achieves the tension compression that we've got in the bottom. And if the bottom boom is not designed for that tension, um, the truss itself can, 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 can fail. Um, now, um, so these structures, if you do want to have fixed supports at the ends, um, you've actually can't use an infinitely stiff support like you got there. Infinite stiff, infinite stiffness is not possible. So you need to work out some sort of spring stiffness or so on, which is so the results will be the real results will be somewhere between the two. Now, bridge engineers stick a bearing under one end, so make sure that they never experience the, the, these problems. Um, now, this is a, a one-span beam. 
Um, what happens if you've got multi spans? Um, now, top model there, two span beam, UDLs. Um, the bending moment is, 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 is just what we expect. But these are, these, these are supports are infinitely stiff. Infinitely, there's actually zero movements uh, in the vertical direction from each of these supports. Real foundations have movements. So if, if we apply some spring stiffnesses under these supports instead, um, we see the bending moment is now wildly different. Um, and this change in bending moment is not from yielding the beam, it's differential movement of the settlements. The, model, the middle, middle support has moved more than the ends. And so the moment has redistributed. If you have the, if the springs, the ground is soft enough, um, you probably could get, um, um, it's getting closer to two sort of um, similar supported beams and so on. So accurate, accuracy in the support stiffnesses can make a big difference to your design moments. Now, I first discovered this <clears throat> a long time ago. I was, uh, I had a job as a graduate engineer. I was, we're modeling a, uh, it's a water reservoir. So it's, it's a concrete structure, water inside, ground on the outside, so ground underneath, ground retainable edge. And so I had to model this to work out the moments and shear forces and so on. And so back in the last year, we only had the um, 1D elements, 2D frames, so nothing as sophisticated as we've got now. So being used to modeling, I knew the base was continuously supported by the ground, so I put pin supports all the way along the bottom. Uh, fine. I then ran the analysis, and the bending moment in the wall looked just what I expected, but the bending moment in the base was, well, it, it was crazy sort of zigzag, and also um, th th those are very strange, very high reactions, um, both positive and negative, uh, around those support points. Now, luckily, I thought, hmm, this doesn't look right. Um, um, you shouldn't be getting bending moments like that and reactions and so on. I mean, such large tensions in the soil, it's not going to happen. So I thought, I'll put in, I'll work out the stiffness of the soil, I'll put in springs instead, and, and, and lo and behold, um, I did that they then produce um, a much more reasonable looking bending moment in, in the base. Um, at the time, that that, 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 that that's where I stopped. But these days, well, I'm preparing this, I thought, well, I know now that even though the soil might have a particular stiffness, once you look at the soil underneath a whole structure, the effective stiffness varies because the soil movement is, is the soil movement changes the relative stiffness under the structure. So you get soil structure interaction. So I did remodel it. Um, with, 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 with a, with a plain stress, plain strain um, soil model underneath. Um, and you see, okay, we're still getting similar results, but the bending moment in the base is a little bit different, but it's not too significant. But yeah, you, 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 when we look at soil models, you, you can, you, you, it may be worthwhile going to a little bit more detail looking at, at the stiffness of the supports um, in your restraints. <laughs> Speaking of restraints, um, a rather surprising error I sometimes see is when um, the engineers get confused between re re restraints and releases. Um, why? I'm not quite sure, but, you know, I mean, both re restraints and releases do begin with R, um, and they're both can be pinned. Um, I mean, this is not the actual, but I mean, a question goes, you know, um, I've put pinned restraints on the ends of all my beams. Why am I getting no load in my columns? It could be because you put pinned restraints <laughs> on all the models. Um, so yeah, don't get confused between these two. Um, they, they're really very different. Um, now, obviously, we do need releases in, in, in our steel frames and so on. Um, um, and so on. Now, actually, the question of releases. 
Um, yeah, we do need releases. We're, we're doing a steel frame, which and the pin steel frame probably counts for about half the structures in in, in the UK. Um, so, so, so yeah, we, we do need to put bending releases on, on the end, ends of the members. Now, you've probably all seen software demonstrations by eager salesmen say, this is how easy it is to knock up a, a multi-frame build, um, story building. And look very closely, because invariably they'll do everything moment connected, because um, it's much easier. I mean, I've done it myself. Um, um, but a real steel frame, you need to model the pins on, on the end of the beams and so on, uh, and suddenly you've got stability problems. Uh, moment frame is self-stabilizing. Um, frame like this, you've got to put in bracing. Um, um, and the stability forces reach the bracing through the floor diaphragm or, 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 or the plan bracing and so on. Plan bracing, you've got to model it explicitly. Um, concrete floor diaphragms, um, you might model that in with plain stress elements to represent the concrete stiffness, <coughs> or maybe rigid constraints to make, make sure there is actually zero lateral movements, but make sure you choose the rigid constraints which still allows vertical movements, because you don't want to stop your beams deflecting vertically. Um, speaking of releases, yeah, um, when you're putting releases onto the beams, don't put releases onto all the ends of all the beams. Um, I've seen this problem a few times where they, they, they put releases on the end of this beam elements and on the ends of this beam element. And suddenly you've got a catenary, which Linda Nassar doesn't like. Put the releases on the ends of the members. So um, choose very carefully where you put the, the releases. Make sure it, it, it's, it, it's realistic. Um, um, now, I mentioned about diaphragms and trusses. Um, mixing floor diaphragms and trusses can lead to unexpected results. Um, so, assuming this structure here, assuming the, 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 there's a roof diaphragm, or maybe it's concrete or so on, and they model it with, with a, a rigid, rigid constraint to tie all the nodes together horizontally. If you do that with a model like this, you will get zero force in the top boom. The rigid constraint has infinite stiffness. Infinite stiffness, no movement, no movement, no strain, no stress, and so on. Um, so if you mix rigid constraints with trusses, um, you can get some unexpected results. The beam elements, they are single elements in the same plane, uh, and they will behave uh, much better. Um, Speaking of trusses as well, yeah. Um, generally, with trusses, you want to use bar elements. The individual elements, um, what you want them to carry axial load only you, you, uh, and not bending moment. I mean, true, the top and bottom booms are continuous. They, they, in reality, well, there'll be some bending moments. Um, and so you might model the top and bottom booms in beam elements, release, uh, maybe release the ends, maybe use the bar elements which have zero bending stiffness or zero bending degrees of freedom in the diagonals <coughs> or bars throughout. Um, now, if you do use bars throughout the model like this, so a 2D model of a truss, it's fine. It's restrained outer plane by the analysis. A 3D model, there is no outer plane restraint on those bottom booms. Um, and use bar elements throughout, this model would fail. So you do have to use some beam elements in a model like this um, to m m make sure there is that outer plane stiffness, even though there's no actual loads in those directions. Um, now, in the um, the heart of the civic centre, this, this is my this is my recreation of, of, of the structure um, derived from, from some of the well, I haven't got the original drawings, but there's there's various papers out there <coughs> talking about about the design. And um, it's interesting in this case, so um, they were assuming, as you can see, that, that, that it's a space frame truss, um, and there's these green diagonal members, and these are bracing the, the, these horizontal members in both directions, because they're coming in at an angle. But over at the edge, um, those, those edge elements are only actually restrained in one direction. They're actually unrestrained in the other. Um, if you, I mean, if you use bar elements, that would, 
that would give you zero stiffness. Um, um, and I, from what I gather from the papers, they forgot that the effective lengths of these edge elements were actually twice as much as, um, as what they're, 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 they're designing for. Um, so don't do that. Um, here's another release which can catch you out. Um, so you can see one release um, or so on um, is, is the elements are not actually connected. Uh, remember, FE analysis, um, for elements to be connected, they've got to share nodes. And this beam over here um, sails straight on th through, 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 through the nodes. Uh, in, this, in this image, I've shrunk the elements. So I've given a graphical shrink, and, and, and it becomes reasonably obvious. But if all the elements are full length in the graphical display, it's not an easy um, problem to spot. <coughs> Another problem to spot is when they, are, they look like they're sharing nodes, but, the, but there's actually two nodes which are coincident. Um, some some programs, I mean, this, this is GSA, which is a program I work on, and, and we do have routines in there to help spot those called coincident nodes in the model, um, and then deal with them. And similar problem is coincident elements. You can have two elements in the same space, sharing the same nodes, um, and then you can end up doubling up with stiffnesses and so on, and that sort of problem. Um, again, can be a difficult spot unless you've got routine to catch them. Uh, another problem. Torsion. Careless torque, I like to call this. Um, torsion is not something we as structural engineers deal with very often. And so it, it can be forgotten. Um, here's an example um, uh, taken from, um, in, in Arab we, we have a, a structural skills network. Um, part of that network, there's, there's a getting it wrong section. Uh, and this is this model I built from, from, from one example which came, came from site. Um, a masonry building on ground beams, on piles, had been designed by another engineer. Um, and they'd done the FE model and they extracted all the bending moments and shear forces and designed the concrete beams for those forces, designed it, uh, uh, and it was being built. Uh, but the thing is, while it was being constructed. So as they were building the masonry walls onto these ground beams, the ground beams failed. Luckily, because it was masonry, they failed slowly because they of the increment of the load slowly. And then Arab was called in for forensic to work out what had gone wrong. Um, now, I said that they designed for the Benny moments and shear force, but there is something strange going on here. So if you look in this corner here, there is Benny moment on the end of one of the beams but no bending moment on the end of the other. So some bending moment has gone missing. Where's it gone? In, the clue was in the previous slide, obviously. Um, in torsion, yes. Um, so, 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 so the structure arrangement was such, it put torsion into, it, it, into some of the members, and the engineer hadn't checked for torsion, so he hadn't designed for torsion, and so, yeah, the, the, um, the, the links just weren't up to the job at, and the structure failed. Um, speaking of torsion, half the civic centre again. Um, the um, designer decided to use cruciform sections, so four angles joined together. Um, the problem with four angles is that they have virtually no torsional stiffness. Um, I mean, it's a truss. It should be axial loads only, in theory. But you then look at the connection. So on the left-hand side was the... Um, so you see, the, the, this is the connections. Oh, well, what's happened to the... Ah, never mind. Um, so the... Yeah, the connections were designed, built a, um, off center to make them work by the fabricator. Um, and this induced quite a lot of um, torsion in, in the elements which didn't have a torsional capacity. Um, also, of course, um, 
you would think looking at the structure, you could get you, you could you could use cruciforms and get plates in there, and everything would line up. But but due to the three D nature nature of the structure, nothing actually lines up. Um, to make the, the the connection plates work, you've either got to twist the elements, or you've got to twist the connections, um, and one or the other happens. And, and I think that that, that probably. Um, 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 contributed to the, um, the, 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 the structure being considerably weaker than, than, than they actually thought. Um, now, you see the connections here. I mentioned that these are offset. Um, so if we go on a slide, um, the question of off, off, offsets themselves. Um, no, is that going to go off? No, not going to go away. All right. Um, so, Offsets. Now, finite elements, elements are, are models um, in a sort of abstract form. Now, if, you, if you're doing a 3D element model, you model all the bits of the structure explicitly, and you know exactly where everything is. Um, but when, when we're dealing with 1D elements, we have a single line which represents the beam, and that line is about the centroid of, of, of the elements, the neutral axis. So, um, um, we need to consider um, exactly what, where it is. Now, um, if you're bringing the model in from your, your BIM program, um, in the BIM side, everything's modeled to the top of steel, so the top flanges all line up, the concrete slab sits on top, and so on. Um, and, and, and it all, all, all looks good, it all looks how it's going to be built, but you must resist the temptation to do the same thing in the structural analysis model. Because um, we are looking at the mathematical behavior of the model. So here's an example. Top, top beam, um, pinned, um, similar to the beam, pinned at both ends. Uh, um, not roller, obviously. Uh, um, this is deliberate. And the lower one, that we've offset it. So um, an offset. Um, is essentially it, it is uh, rigid links which which allow the, the beam to be positioned away from the the original nodes. So if the program doesn't do offset directly, you can use rigid links in there. Now in this case, the lower case, the top flange is lining up through. And when we analyze this, and both are under a UDL, um, the top one you get the bending moment zero at the ends, vertical reactions as you expect. The lower one, on the other hand. Look, uh, we've got hogging moments at the ends of the beams. We've got a huge horizontal reactions at each end. And if, if it was a roller, we would get a, a horizontal movement instead. Um, and there's also an axial load in that element, which, which I've not shown. Um, so uh, with, with this offset, we're, we're essentially, we're essentially we're hanging the beam from the top uh, rather than rather the centroids. And, uh, and, and it will either produce some very unrealistic forces in your model, or it will be dragging the rest of the structure over and giving you some quite strange deflections and so on. So in general, do not offset your model unless you really want to. So there are cases, if you're modeling a, um, a composite floor, so we've got a beam elements, 2D elements for the slabs, we offset the beams down, the slab up, and lo and behold, we then get a composite action. You can see um, we, we, you know, we, we're getting, getting compression in the slab, there is tension in the, in the beam as well, and then there's some strange, I mean, the, um, you can see, see there's a slight sort of sawtooth in the bending moments um, because of the way the 1D and 2D elements are interacting together. The real bending moment is probably an average of the two. Um, also note, whilst this models composite floors with 100% interaction, <coughs> partial interaction is a little bit harder, harder to model. Um, yeah, you might have to use springs or something in there. It, it, it's getting a bit tricky. Um, so yeah, so remember the yeah the BIM model is there to represent the physical reality of the structure. Um, the analysis model is there to represent the m m mathematical behaviour of the structure. The two are not the same. So 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 be very careful when, when, when you're transferring between between the two programs. Speaking of which, um, there was a recent Scotch report 
not this project, but this was a, a nice picture uh, uh, for a BIM model. Um, Scott's report of project reached site, and the contractor phoned up the consultant and said, there seem to be some columns missing. Um, yeah, there was about half a dozen columns, not on the ground floor, not on the first floor, but there were on the, the upper floors with no transfer structure. Um, um, the consultant said, oh, the columns are missing because I used BIM. <sighs> no, the columns are missing because they didn't check. Um, I mean, it, it's possible that in some transfer or something, some elements didn't get transferred across, and they, and they assumed that just because they were transferring the data, they were transferring all the data. Um, and in this case, no, they didn't. So, yes. Um, Make sure you, you check. You may be using software, but you as the engineer are still responsible for, for the final construction. And it's just as well, well the contractor did query it, otherwise who knows what will have happened. Um, now, getting back to offsets. Um, there are times when you definitely want to mo model your offsets. Um, so connections and that sort of thing. Um, now, so, so in this case, you know, connections, you want mo model the offsets. And these connections will generate additional forces on the elements. Um, now, you know, one example is your beams are coming into your columns. So in the steel codes, the, 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 um, they say you must assume the beam actually is offset by the half the thickness of the column, plus I think it's 150 mil and so on, to generate an eccentric moment on the column. Um, um, and you can model this directly into your model. But if you do, just remember that whilst, whilst you design the column correctly, you might underdesign the beam if you use that bending moment. If you have the, the beams going to the centroid of the column, which is the default, you are underdesigning the columns and overdesigning the beams. Hopefully within tolerances uh, and factors of safety. Um, and maybe a good so do you need two models? I mean, hopefully a good compromise is um, maybe to just model the beams to, 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 to the edge of the columns. And so the columns will be a little bit under, the beams will be about right and so on. Anyway, um, you might need several models. Look very closely at the moments which are going into the columns. There should be moments. Um, if there are, I mean, a, a building design program might add these in automatically. An FE program with a design will not. Um, it will work to the forces and moments which you su supply in the model. Uh, and if, if there should be eccentric moments, you need to make sure they are there in, in your analysis. So yes, yeah, so the Harvard Civic Center, yeah, top, top, top connections. These are what, what the engineer assumed during, during the design. And the lower ones were what was actually built. And you can see with the, these eccentric, eccentric connections, there were torsions going into, the, into these, the, 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 these, um, these sections which were not up to it. So to offset or not to offset, uh, as something nearly says, um, offsets are very powerful, can be very useful, can also be very dangerous. So um, use them wisely. Um, um, yeah, um, um, uh, when I was looking at the, uh, the buckling capacity of, of, of the Hartford space frame, um, adding the offsets in actually reduced the buckling capacity of the structure by, um, by about 25%. Um, so if they had included it in, they, they, they might have got away with it possibly, apart from all the other design flaws. Um, so yeah, it can make quite a large difference. Meshing. Oh, another fine mesh. Um, this can be a bit, bit, bit of an art sometimes. Now, when I was an undergraduate learning about FE analysis for the first time, I learned about 1D elements, yeah, and the 1D elements were connected to the nodes, which are the, connect, the, the connection points and so on. And it all fitted in nicely with sort of beam theory, which I've been learning. And then we got to 2D elements, and all these 2D elements, which were connected 
at the, at the nodal points. And I thought, well, are we modeling love, little squares of concrete and steel which connect to the ends, which means the stresses are going to be huge because the, the you know, stress concentrations and so on. No, I misunderstood. Um, when you're dealing with meshes and so on, we're not modeling individual pieces of structure. We are modeling the nodes. Remember, FE analysis is actually all about the nodes in the structure, not the elements. It's an easy, it's an easy mistake to make. It's about the nodes, how the nodes move, uh, and how the differences in the nodes move, um, so on. So what we're modeling in the mesh here is points of interest. We, so we need nodes at the support points. We need nodes around the edges. We need nodes uh, where loads are applied. Uh, and we need nodes in the mesh uh, where the forces and so on are changing rapidly. So we need a bit more detail of, of, of what is going on. So we're modeling a continuum with, with, with points within that, in that um, continuum. And these points are joined together by 2D elements or 3D elements. Um, to represent the structure between, between the, 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 those points of interest. Um, now, Schleppner, ah, oh, oil rig. Um, here is actually, the, left, the picture is not actually Schleppner, it's actually the troll, but it, 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 I think it's essentially the same design. So Schleppner, um, you see it's a concrete structure, um, a large number of, of concrete tanks, which are hollow, and to begin with, these contain air, and then later on they'll, they will be um, containing oil and so on as a storage and so on. It's a, it's called a gravity base. And this is a picture of their FE model. Now, um, you can see it's all modelled in 3D brick elements, so it looks very good, very sophisticated. It's modelling the whole complexity of the structure, and um, very good. They knew that the model was symmetrical. So they, they, they only modeled a quarter of the structure, save on computation. We, this, is, um, this is the early 90s we're talking about. So, so computers were a lot less powerful than they are today. Um, so in that respect, good model. Uh, and I'll say this model is probably very good for producing overall behaviors of the structure, um, deflections and so on. Um, and you can see in the plan there, so, so, so the, the idea is it's built on land, it's floated out to sea, they fill up, um, as happens, they fill up these sort of gaps in between the, 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 the tanks with seawater, it sinks to the bottom, uh, and it's all fine. And it's designed to, um, it's actually got 97.5 metres of depth of water there, uh, which of course, you know, times by 10, um, 975 kilonewtons per square meter, or um, kilopascals, if for quite a lot larger loads than we're used to dealing with ordinary buildings. Um, so, um, so huge loads inside these tricells acting on the walls, and um, if we look at their FE model, so a slice from their model from previous screen, we can see this is sliced through, and we see that, that this is this is the FE mesh. At this point, now, I said the model was was pretty good for overall behaviour, um, but um, in terms of detailed behaviour, it was terrible. Um, remember, FE analysis is done at the nodal points, so they were looking at the stresses or um, or the, 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 you know, the stress stresses at the nodes and then interpolating across. Unfortunately, the mesh is nowhere near detailed enough to actually calculate the stresses correctly. They actually underestimated the stresses by nearly 50%. Um, and ironically, a simple calculation on the back of a fag packet it would have been then, maybe a post-it note now, could have told them they got the answer wrong. But they just took the numbers out of the computer and worked with them. Now, 50%... That might have been within facts of safety, possibly. Uh, unfortunately, they also detailed it terribly. Um, so, you know, they, they, they put this off. They knew the stress concentration in the corners. They put a T-headed bar in there. And unfortunately, they didn't realize that the shear force would just go right around the end and, and, and break, break the charger. Previous, um, previous oil rig, they had had cracking in these locations, but didn't listen to the warning signs. 
Um, they, 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 they didn't think, oh, there's a problem here, we should do something about it. They went, ah, it's still all right. Um, we got away with this. Um, so second time round, um, they didn't. I mean, said, I mean, seven hundred million dollars in 1991. That equates to approximately one billion pounds today. That is not something you want on your PI um, insurance claim. Um, so your meshing, yeah, you, you want to have a su sufficient mesh density to give you the answers. So, so um, what they should have done was maybe do a detailed model looking at these these areas of interest. Now, in these three pictures, I've modelled just just a two D mesh, and the left hand one, I've got the mesh as it was, and then the middle one, I've halved the mesh, and the right hand one, I've I've halved the mesh again. And you can see as the mesh density increases. Um, the stresses do grow in, in, in the middle of the elements. Um, we get a bit more detail of what, 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 what's going on. But there's also another strange phenomenon is that uh, when you get down to these corners, these sort of sharp corners, you get stress concentration. Um, and the weird thing about FE analysis here is that the smaller the elements, the smaller you make the elements, the higher the stresses will go. So at the extreme, an infinitely small element will have an infinitely high stress. Now, obviously, that's not going to happen in reality. Um, so um, you've got to take an engineering judgment and say, well, there's either fine enough mesh and, and that's OK, or model reporting a really high stress, but, but well, we can safely ignore it because it will just crack and, and, and dissipate or something. Um, we're out of time. Um, so um, are there errors you can make in the, in the meshing? So discontinuities. Left-hand edge of the mesh, we've got small elements and large elements, but they just stop. Now, the nodes in a mesh have to be, they're in a continuum, they have to be completely surrounded by, by, by 2D elements, and so there's actually an edge. So the nodes on the left are discontinuous. They're attached to the left, but not the right. So you need to have some, some transition between the mesh densities. Likewise, if you're using different formulations, so a quad 4 to a quad 8, again, that middle node is only connected to the right-hand element, not the left. This will cause problems. Um, another problem. Um, this is a flat slab or a piece of flat slab with a column attached to it, pin base, as they all are. Um, but these are quad eight elements. Quad eight elements normally only, can only have five degrees of freedom. They, it's very, very difficult to put a drilling or ZZ degree of freedom onto a quad eight element. And so this column here will actually be torsionally unstable, zero stiffness. Um, solution, stick a ZZ restraint, um, or Z, Z axis restraint are onto those elements. I mean, foundations do have a torsion restraint, even if we don't use them. So just, just model it in. Um, I said we could go home, home by, by midnight, didn't we? Yeah. Um, so second order effects, buckling under pressure. Um, yeah. Static analysis, it's, it's a linear analysis, it, it, working out the equilibrium at the initial position. So here we've got a nice little beam, single point load, we've got a bending moment, some reaction so on, it all looks good. But then we look at the stresses in that, that, that element and you think, oh, we're getting stresses of about nearly 700 um, uh, megapascals. Kilopascals. Then use the per for squares. That beam should have yielded or failed or something. Um, as a linear analysis, this, this model is not working. Um, so we need to change it to a non-linear analysis. The beam does yield, um, and then instead of get beam moment, we also get axial load in the structure. If we don't get axial load, if we've got a roller at the end, this beam will actually collapse and you end up with a, um, just a hanging cable. Um, so in this situation, we do want those horizontal reactions. Um, speaking of, you know, P delta effects. Um, here we have one column, vertical loads, small horizontal loads, um, and I've subjected it to, to a linear and a non-linear analysis. So same structure, same loads, very, very different results. So the right-hand one is non-linear analysis. It has buckled, the, we had a P delta effect. So you see the bending moment at the bottom is four or five times larger than the bending moments of the, of the linear analysis. Um, the way you build a model can exacerbate this. So um, we tend to build FE models perfectly vertical. 
But in reality, on site, there's tolerances. Things are out of plumb and so on, and that can add to these effects. Normally, we might add in notional horizontal loads and so on, but the non-linear analysis, we, we can then model the, the, those explicitly. Um, speaking of buckling, um, again, we, with columns for a linear analysis, we might just use a single element, and it works fine. For buckling analysis, modal buckling, um, we need to have a mid-height node. Remember, the analysis is done at the nodal positions. So you see, you see the two, two columns, one broken in half. The load factor of the single element is about 20% higher than the, 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 the element in, in two pieces. Um, if you were to model it a single piece, you would, you would be um, um, inappropriately confident about the capacity of these elements. Um, now, this, this problem gets even worse when you look at 2D mesh buckle, buckling. Now, here, here's a study I did a few years ago looking at hyperbolic um, shells, you know, cooling towers and so on. Um, and I looked at a variety of mesh sizes. So, in this first one, <coughs> I've got quite a crude mesh. I say it's a 30 degrees. So, each of those nodes is 30 degrees around, around the structure. So, so, we're getting quite a large mesh and we're getting quite a crude buckling mode. And you notice the buckling is very much driven by the elements. And as we increase the mesh density, um, the, 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 the buckling mode gets more and more detailed. And, um, and we can see here, the, the buckling is still sort of following the mesh lines, um, which is maybe not ideal. And we get, get to the, 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 this position where the buckling mode is now sort of independent of the meshing, um, and uh, so quite a fine mesh, so two and a half degrees, so there's lots and lots of elements in here. Um, and so I'm, get, I'm getting a, a modal buckling shape which I'm confident with, but um, you probably couldn't see the small print. There's also the, 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 the buckling low capacity. So I'll go on to the next slide. Um, you can see from the crude mesh to the fine mesh, we are going from buckling load factor of nearly 400 down to about five. Um, you know, if, you, if, you, if you build a crude mesh, um, you can vastly over predict um, your, your, your bucking capacity. So the trick with this sort of thing is half the mesh, recheck it. Half the mesh again, recheck it. If you don't get any improvements, so as you can see down, down the bottom here, um, you're sort of reaching a point where, 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 where the model is probably sufficiently detailed to give you the answer you're looking for. Um, also buckling. Um, some problems you can do linear buckling and non-linear buckling. So a linear buckling modal analysis to look at all the way the, the structure could buckle. Non-linear, it will increment the loads until the structure fails and it will give you the first buckling mode. Um, the two answers should be similar but the chances are the non-linear buckling factor will be lower than the, the linear. This is quite normal. Um, second order effects kicking in. If you use yielding you know, material non-linearity non as well, then the load factor will be even lower. And you see that that graph can actually kink down at the ends and so on. So buckling in the FE analysis. So if you're doing um, design on your FE analysis results, you have to know whether the design routines are taking buckling into account. Now, a building design model might well assume buckling and therefore factor things in and so on, whereas an FE model will not. It will take the forces you apply. So you need to know whether your program does include buckling effects and therefore you don't include them, otherwise you'll over-design, or it doesn't include them, and therefore you must include them, otherwise you'll underdesign. Um, so either way, um, you need to know what, what the program is doing. You know, just treating it as a black box um, means you, you, you've got a good chance of either over or under designing the structure, and you won't necessarily know which, which you're doing. Obviously, over design is better, but um, all the same. Um, so buckling your half a civic sensor. So, they use the cruciform section on the left from four angles. If they had rearranged the angles, maybe into an I section or a box section, for the same weight, the same cross-section area, they could have had structural members with going from virtually no buckling capacity 
to a very high buckling capacity. And, and maybe um, the structure wouldn't have failed so, so disastrously. Okay, starting to wrap things up. Uh, validation. Now we get into checking. Checking the model. Now, checking comes under, well, two categories, really. We call them validation and verification. This is all checking the model. Now, validation, the first one, is, is the model realistic? Um, now, there is a, a nice official de de definition, um, but, you know, does the model represent reality? You know, are there the, those horizontal reactions you can, you can use and so on? Um, so this breaks down into two categories. There's the, <coughs> the valid model. You know, are the reactions there? Are the offsets there or not? Uh, and so on. Are using appropriate uh, materials and so on. And there's also the software validation. Is the software appropriate for the, 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 the analysis you're doing? Um, from my own experience, um, again, back in the early 90s when FE analysis wasn't really that easy, we had a computer in the office. Yes, I know, j j just the one. Um, um, and on there, it had a concrete design program, ADC, which I rightly are now work with now from the other side, but it would, de it would design multi-span beams. Now, I had to do timber beams multi-span, and I thought, well, I could do the moment redistribution thing that I learned at university and uh, to take me forever, or I could use the concrete design program, stick in the loads, switch off self-weight, get the Benny moments out, and then use those in my timber design. Um, was that valid? Possibly. Um, a lot of it depends on whether shear stiffness and so on was taken into account. But anyway, um, nothing ever fell down. So I was probably okay. But yeah, the software might not be appropriate. You have to watch out for this. So things like um, you've got a diaphragm and going to a stability core. Does it take into account voids around the, uh, the core? Um, does, the, does your flat slab program include punching shear? Um, this is a picture from a friend of mine, and said, yeah, the engineer concerned didn't realize that the program did not calculate punching shear. Um, the computer said it was fine, um, but as you can see, luckily it failed during construction and nobody was hurt. But um, yeah, so that is what a punching shear failure actually looks like. It, it's not a skateboard park. Um, now, does the model consider stability? You know, stability of the steel frame and so on. Um, it might assume stability, but have you taken that into account? Yeah. Never forget stability. Um, and for those of you planning to do your structures exam, instant failure point for forgetting it. Okay. Um, okay, so validation. So is it realistic? Then verification, is the model correct? Um, so whenever you're designing, analyzing a structure, you should have expectations of what the end result should be. And if the results don't match up with your expectations, something's gone wrong. So why could this be? It could be your model is wrong. Um, it could be your expectations are wrong. You, you, you're expecting something else and you're getting it wrong. Or it could be the software is wrong. Now, in general terms, it's not the software. Okay? Um, it's usually one or two. Um, so so, so if, if you do get something unexpected, think very carefully. Look into it and work out what is happening. So, 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 so verification, again, there's a nice big... Um, definition of there, but the thing to remember is, yeah, is it correct? Verification, ver error, the errorification. Look for errors in in your results. Now, how do we go about about, about about checking for errors apart from expectations and so on? Quick calculations. Um, so, imagine you're designing a, a truss. You do the truss model and so on, but um, you can very very quickly. Um, work out what the peak forces and so on are going to be on this truss. You know, assume it's a beam. 
So bending a moment, W all squared upon 8, divide by the depth of the truss, gives you the force in the top and bottom boom. The shear force, you can work out the shear force, quite easy for a beam, and then look at the angle, angle of the diagonals and work out the axial forces at the ends of the elements. The deflection of the truss. Um, you, you know the deflection formula for a beam. Um, the eye of the truss is going to be that, that formula at the bottom, looking at um, the air of the trusses and their, their separation and so on. So it's very quick and easy to work out approximately what the key values are going to be on the truss. And if it doesn't match up, you've made a mistake, either in the analysis or in your hand calculations. Um, likewise, Schleppner. Um, the the, the, the tricell walls were essentially a fixed-ended beam. Um, so, fixed-ended beam, you can work out the moment at the end, moment in the middle, W squared upon 12 this time, or 24 in the middle, and the shear force, WL, WL upon 2. That one line calculation would have told them that what the shear force should have been in, in, in the wall at the bottom, and they would have known that they'd got it wrong and they would have dealt with it. Um, other checks you can do. Um, if you're doing a static model, run a dynamic model. If you're doing a dynamic, run a static uh, and look at, look at the results. So, um, you know, look at the typical frequency. So a, a, a bridge will normally resonate around about one hertz. Floors, four to eight hertz in general, and you can recalculate the floor frequency approximately by hand, uh, which is the 18 over the square root of the deflection. Building, tall building frequencies is approximately 10 over the number of stories. Um, these give you ballpark figures to tell you what the, the, the frequencies should be, and if you're similar, you're good. Um, if they're not, you know, there's a problem. I mean, uh, one of my colleagues, we were designing um, a shopping center up, 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 in, up in Doncaster. He accidentally put in 200 thick steel slabs rather than concrete um, and then wondered why it wasn't vi vi vibrating very much. <laughs> um, other things, um, well, they're called bronze diagrams. You know, you've got a frame, sketch out the, the deflected shape and the bending moment before you start. Um, I mean, bronze diagrams named after Dr. David Braun, um, former Arab Fellow, um, created the, 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 the diagram tests as part of the graduate recruitment. Um, 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 and I'm not sure I still use them in FE courses, because it's quite good, good to remember is that um, it's quite, you should be able to work out the flexure shape in many moments, shapes, if not, not the values, very quickly. And if you don't know what they should be, then should you be doing the model at that point? Um, yeah, because uh, if you don't know what the answers are, then how do you know what the answers should be? But then if you do know the answers, then do you need to do the calculation? Um, basically, you should know approximately what the answers are, uh, and then use the FE analysis to give you the detail, the, the more accurate results. Um, speaking of ac accuracy, you know, remember, check things like total erosion reactions. Do they, do they balance? Check things like mesh shapes. Are they not too stretched? And so on? are they nicely squared, nicely triangular? Check for very long, very short elements, because those wide range of stiffness can cause problems. Um, problems enveloping. Um, this is an um, example from, from Paul, who's, who's on, on our um, um, digital workflow committee. He got normally called, called, out, called out with this recently. It's a case where there was two reactions on, on the support. And you see five and minus seven, minus one, two, and so on with the, with the values. Now, when they first took the, the, the max and min out in the envelope, it just gave them the individual vectors. Unfortunately, if you then combine those max and min um, axial directions, you end up um, with a lower total force than you would do from, from the individual components. So the, 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 uh, luckily, they spotted this. This is a, this is a bad um, example of... of, of um, Enveloping. Now, um, I don't know which program they were using. Um, um, so a good envelope should look at the individual components and also give you the maximum values as well. So something to watch out for. Now, I mentioned that the software is not normally wrong, but it can happen. Um, you know, um, 
we're professionals. We, um, especially my colleagues, have got PhDs, uh, 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 and we spend a lot of effort testing the software, uh, making sure that it's given the right answers out, and so on. So, so um, test after test after test is done to make sure the software is as accurate as possible. But, but mistakes can still slip through. There are the occasional bugs. I mean, it's probably impossible to make bug-free software apart from the hello world option you do when you first start. But I mean, our, our GSA program has got about two million lines of code in there. Um, there, 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 there could be things. So um, just watch out for that. So um, checklist for checking. Um, oh, there we go. Um, first stage, look and think. Does it look right? Um, as you know, ooh, Oh, okay, never mind. Um, so, so yeah, does it look right? As you know, if you give results to when you're senior engineers, they'll look at your results and go, that's wrong. You say, how did you know that was wrong? Um, it's the experience. They, 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 they used to think about this. So does it deflect right? Uh, do the belly moments look right? Are the, is the stresses sensible? Are there discontinuities in results? Um, stage two, look at more the, the answers. They do a separate hand calculation, do a separate model, a simpler model, and so on. Um, and then if you're going to check really, really carefully, um, build the model again, um, either in the same program or, or a different program where you need to get somebody else to build the program, the model in a different program, yeah, what we call a CAT3 check. And if still giving the same answers, then you can feel quite confident. Um, place it to look for, for errors. You know, just recap, you know, ill conditioning, units, restraints, offsets, torsion, meshing, second order effects, and forgetting to validate or verify, forget to check your model. Um, yeah, and so remember, ensure your model is sufficiently detailed, but not overcomplicated. Um, make sure it's realistic. And remember, make things as simple as possible, but not oversimplify. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's simple to make something difficult and difficult to make something simple. Uh, Engineering is an art, uh, uh, and we were looking for that area in, in between. So, in conclusion, um, structural engineering. What is structural engineering? Art of designing structures to withstand loads we cannot predict, using materials with properties we cannot measure, by methods of analysis that are approximate, and to do so in a way that ensures the client and public are ignorant of our shortcomings. <laughs> um, yes. Um, yeah, conclusion, Ma um, maths is a core engineering skill and computers are very, very good at doing maths and doing maths at lightning speed. Um, and the FE, FE method is key, a key stone to, to, to the engineering approach that we do these days. We can't, we can't work without it. Um, and, it's, and it enables us to build structures that are just not possible in, 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 in the past. Um, but of course, with that great power comes great responsibility. As a wise man uh, once said, yeah, um, we can do amazing things, but we can also get things spectacularly wrong as well. So Hartford Civic Six Centre, um, they produce an unrealistic, an unvalidated model. Schreppner, validation, uh, verification that they had errors in the model, which, which they didn't spot. Um, so, but that's it. The end. Yeah, the uh, the re rewards for success are great. Uh, and we can now achieve structures which are undreamed of um, by, by our forebears and, and, and so on. So go, um, go and create some wonderful and safe structures. Uh, thank you very much.